Σα καλωσορίσουμε σε αυτό το βίντεο του Ψυχολογίν, όπου έχουμε την ιδιαίτερη χαρά και τιμή να φιλοξενούμε σήμερα τον κύριο Φαρακόρικα και την κυρία Γεωργία Μπαλογιάννη και οι δύο ψυχοθεραπευτέ, τραυματοθεραπευτέ, σε μια συζήτηση για το ψυχικό τραύμα και πιο συγκεκριμένα για το Deep Brain Reorienting, σύγχρονο μοντέλο για την θεραπεία του ψυχικού τραύματο. Να πω δύο λόγια σύντομα για τον κύριο Φρανκ, ότι είναι ψυχίατρο νευροεπιστήμονα με μακροχρόνια εμπειρία στη ψυχοθεραπεία και στην θεραπεία του ψυχικού τραύματο, συνδυάζοντα τι νευροεπιστήμε και το συγκινησιακό κομμάτι, αλλά και την επιστήμη τη ψυχοθεραπεία. Είναι ο εμπνευστή του Deep Brain Reorienting. Και στη συζήτησή μας θα συμμετέχει η, η, η συγγήτρια του DBR στην Ελλάδα, η Γεωργία Μπαλογιάννη, επίσης ψυχολόγος, ψυχοθεραπεύτρια και τραυματοθεραπεύτρια, με μακρόχρονη εμπειρία και αυτή στη θεραπεία, την ψυχοθεραπεία και την θεραπεία του ψυχικού τραύματος. Οπότε να δώσουμε το λόγο στους συνομιλητές μας. Γεωργία, Φρανκ, you are welcome. We are really happy to have you today. Uh, thank you, Lainey and Diana, for inviting me to be here to have this discussion with your year, because it's been great to have your year's introduction to Greece, and um, your year has been instrumental in bringing DBR to Greece, arranging the trainings and the consultation groups and so on. So I look forward to continuing collaboration. Thank you, Frank. It's a great honor to have you here. And I was waiting for this conversation for a long time. I want to start with the basic. I will read the definition of trauma according to APA, American Psychological Association, which says, trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Reactions such as shock and denial are typical. Longer-term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationship, and even physical symptoms. I want to ask you, what do you feel about this definition? Because my feeling is that it's uh, something is missing. It's not complete. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have the feeling that the, the bodily part of the trauma is uh, somewhat... Yeah, and I think that trauma means different things to different people because it depends on one's experience rather than the event itself. Many people can experience an earthquake, for example, but not everybody will experience it as traumatic. And there are also other events in a person's life, other experiences, that can be felt as traumatic, they can be shocking and horrifying, but they wouldn't be anything like as obviously traumatic as earthquakes or assaults. And I do agree with you, it's important to include the body reaction because, as we know from Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk and other pioneers in this field, um, the body holds the the memories that are relevant to the adverse experiences that have been shocking and horrifying. When we think about trauma and a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, we all uh, think about flashback, nightmares, avoidant behaviors, unwanted emotions. And okay, those are the most common of uh, uh, PTSD. Do you feel that there are other symptoms, other conditions related uh, to trauma? I I think there are many conditions that have their origins and events that have been experienced as traumatic, and they may not be as as obvious as the links in PTSD, for example, but you can see many conditions, eating disorders, substance abuse disorders, obsessive-compulsive disorders, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, there are many conditions that have their origins in adverse experiences. And the thing about the adverse experience is that the brain cannot fully take it in, cannot look at it and see it and process everything about it so that the body reactions settle without difficulty. 
there's something about traumatic experience that we cannot take in and that leaves an impact on the body which can result in symptoms many years after the, the experience. Talking about the impact in the body, since you are a well-known neuroscientist, I think that you have a fluency, knowledge uh, and understanding of the human brain. What is the impact of the uh, trauma in the brain? And uh, I, I've gone back to the, the, the basics to try to find out what happens first in the brain. And that's why I've got this focus now on the midbrain and the upper brainstem, because when we orient to something that is horrifying or shocking or otherwise disturbing, the first reaction, I believe, is in the brainstem. And that's where we get the first um, physiological response generated from. That, I think that's that's why my focus has come down to the, the brainstem and that's why we attend to it in the DBR theory. Since the impact of the brain is actually in the brainstem, mainly in the brainstem, how can we access to the brainstem in order so, to help the client do the healing? In DBR, we argue that there are two main pathways that mediate the impact of an event. So the first pathway is through shock and horror responses that are involving the locus ceruleus in the, in the brainstem and the, the projections that come from there upwards into the thalamus and cortex. The second main pathway is through the midbrain periaqueductal grey to the basic affects, the fear, the rage, the grief, the shame, and to the defensive responses associated to fight or flight um, or, or to hide away, for example. So to get to these first responses and what the and the effects they have on the body, we need to turn our attention to the body feelings that come up when we think about the traumatic events, the traumatic experiences. What are the first responses in the body when we turn our attention to those? So what I understand is that uh, with DBR, we can go to the roots let's say, of the trauma, the impact of the trauma in the brain, the very first, the, the, the very beginning. So is this what differentiates, uh, in a, because you are well experienced in other uh, modalities, but uh, uh, are the other modalities more in a um, prefrontal cort cortex, upper brain, and uh, through DBR we can go deeper? I mean, there are many different uh, modalities for treating trauma, and many of them are very effective. In my view, all the ones that are based that are effective are based on body awareness. So, uh, starting with the body awareness is common to many different approaches that are effective, but we're very specific in DPR. We're looking for. Um, a sequence that we know from neuroscience to occur in the brainstem primarily. So we're, we've got our focus on the brainstem and what the first response to the memory is. Focusing on the brainstem and the very first response helps us in a way to work with very early traumas. Uh, I mean, in an age where uh, there is no memories, there, there is no, uh, the upper, the prefrontal cortex is not uh, well developed. Can DBR access very, very early traumas? I believe so. I, I have no way of proving it, of course, and um, many people would, would disagree um, that it is possible. But even in animal studies, there's evidence of 
long-term effects of early trauma on brain systems. And I, I think that we can get into the body reactions that have been learned in infancy and we can process those body reactions. Because it's pre-verbal, we don't get episodic memories. Um, so we can never be absolutely sure where it comes from. But the important thing is that we're clearing a sequence of responses that's been held in the body and clearing that produces clinical benefit and that's what it's all about it's it's getting that clinical benefit so even if we cannot uh, scientifically prove some things the uh, recovery of a trauma the, the client having no symptoms anymore and uh, having a great improvement in health, it's a proof uh, itself. I, I think so. I mean, that, that's what patients want. It's to get better. And they want to get better with minimal distress. And one of the, the, the things about trauma therapy is that it can be quite distressing for patients um, because they can feel that they're reliving the original trauma. So in DPR, we're looking to have an anchor in the body that prevents overwhelm, that prevents dissociation secondary to the, to the overwhelm. We're trying to make sure that the, the processing that's required for the clinical improvement occurs with minimal distress um, to the person. So, Frank, you, what you say is that um, with TBR, using uh, uh, the bodily sensation as an anchor, we help the client process the trauma with the mi minimum distress? Is yeah. that what you we're, say? Yep. Yeah. And we're using a very specific anchor in the body in DBR because we're, we argue that the first response when orienting to anything happening is a tension around the face, the back of the neck, that that's the first response. And if we're able to pick that up and focus on it, it gives an anchor for the processing to, to prevent overwhelm and to prevent the, the the distress becoming extreme to the point that dissociation occurs. So that anchor allows processing to flow in the way that the brain needs it to flow for healing. So what I understand is that uh, DBR help us go to the basic affects and process, help the client process without getting overwhelmed. Am I understanding right? That's certainly the aim of DPR, and that's been my experience generally with it. That, and it's you know greatly to my surprise at times that having the orienting tension um, it's, it's acts as an anchor that prevents the overwhelming affects, that prevents dissociation from coming in. So we can access the underlying pain uh, caused by the trauma that uh, has all this symptomatology and uh, all these different ways to appear and disrupt a person's life. Yeah. And, and if it's very early relational trauma, interpersonal trauma, for example, then there may be a very deeply held pain um, which is not really recognised because it triggers affects like fear and rage and grief and shame so the affects tend to take over the awareness if we can find a way into this deep level process then we get the orienting tension and that allows us to go into the pain and all the affects that flow without getting overwhelmed it allows us to stay with them so that the brain can process them in whatever way it needs to. What I've noticed with my clients is that uh, although at the beginning 
Sometimes they hesitate to try something new. They were afraid that they will relieve the trauma and they will get overwhelmed. Their experience is very positive. It's very relieving. At the end of the session, they, were, they are very stable. And uh, even if it's not clear at, uh, completely, the trauma, they have less symptomatology and uh, they feel more free. What I uh, very often hear from my clients is that I feel very free. Uh, is this uh, something you share with your clients? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm pleased to hear that you also have that experience that even when people are reluctant to initially to approach the trauma memories, that using DBR allows them to go into the process in a way that they find safe and controlled. And that helps the person to feel in command of the process and to be able to go with it, even if it's a small piece at a time, just processing, you know, piece by piece. And often each session then of processing something, even if it's quite small, it leaves the person feeling better, more hopeful, more free, perhaps feeling more space around them, just more connection with the self. And these are all benefits that I see regularly. Yes, what people are sharing with me is that they feel in this space around them, they feel that they exist more. Yeah. So, since um, DBR is a trauma therapy, a moda- trauma therapy modality, and for a therapist to use DBR, to be trained in DBR, do they need a previous experience, a previous education to another modality? Is there something that is pre-request in order to get trained to DBR? The, the key thing about trauma therapy using a method like DBR is that it's an organic process. It's, a, it's healing that comes from within the person and the therapist has to respect that the, the patient's brain knows best how to manage that healing process. So we as therapists need to be able to allow that process to flow even if it means sometimes that we're sitting in silence and that we don't really know what's going on in the person's brain, but it's allowing that healing to flow in the way that it needs to flow. So um, so people who are, who, are more, um, who are more at ease with that tend to be therapists who've already done some body-based trauma therapy. So they will be, I think, most at ease with using DPR. So, okay, Frank, uh, there is another question uh, that rises in my mind uh, now. Do all clients can benefit from a DPR or there are some, category, uh, some cases that they will uh, not benefit? Is it safe to use it to all of our clients? And that's a benefit in people who have severe complex trauma histories. I find that even if if it seems on the surface that what we're processing is quite a small part of their whole trauma history, processing it with DBR allows them to be in the body in a different way. And it allows people to connect up more with their experience of being in the body and to feel that the body is their own and gradually to get more and more confidence in that body awareness. And sometimes I think that's what produces a major part of the improvement. It's the ability to to feel ownership of one's body, to, to feel this is my body and to feel that healing process is available within it. And also because lots of traumas has uh, caused lots of pain in the body. So having this restoring a relationship with the body, that the body on the one hand uh, holds the pain, 
but also has the healing uh, uh, capacity, I feel that it's very restoring in the yeah. relationships someone has with its body. Yeah. Because it's not actually a healing that it's coming from outside, it's a healing that it's coming from inside. A totally new view of the body. <clears throat> yeah, as therapists, um, we, we are setting up the, the situation so that the person has the maximal opportunity to process, to get into the healing flow in the way that, that suits their brain and body. So what's preoccupied me over the years is what's happening in the brain during that healing process. And I've been looking for ways to make it more accessible and safer so that it, um, people can you know, engage with the healing from even things that have been very shocking or horrifying to them. So it's a totally new uh, perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has its roots in many different approaches, but the idea of reorienting, I think, is a relatively new way of looking at healing. It's the idea that some things that we just couldn't look at before we couldn't orient towards them without having major um, disturbance in our body or major clinical symptoms of anxiety or depression or obsessions or compulsions or self-harm impulses. It's the idea that we're gradually able to orient towards these events and experiences and memories without having the, the overwhelming and disturbing responses. So Frank, since you are the creator, inspirator, developer of the DBR model, what uh, was the, the need uh, that uh, led you to the uh, development of DBR? There, there were a few pathways into it. Um, one of them was being asked to by somebody to define what I thought was happening in the midbrain when they were having um, freeze responses. So I was telling the person what I thought was happening in the superior colliculi and the periaqueductal gray. And even although the language is very technical, we noticed that as I was communicating this information, the person was actually getting better, that the freeze responses were clearing. So it was almost as if um, being able to slow it down enough to say, I think that's activating your superior colliculus, and I think that's activating the dorsal PAG, and now you're getting sleepy. I think that's activating the ventral lateral PAG, and it was as if slowing it down like that um, and attending to each component of the sequence was enough to clear the sequence that had been there from infancy, it seemed. Um, so that allowed a clearing um, unexpectedly through, through the, the neuroanatomy. The other um, main driver was looking for a way to get into experiences of attachment shock that didn't involve ego states, because most of the time I'd been working with ego states or self states or different parts of the self. And I found that when dealing with attachment shock from a recent event, there wasn't necessarily an ego state involvement and I found that going into what was happening in the body with that shock below the ego state level led into this awareness of another pathway that occurs before the affects, before the defence responses. So that was critical for me too, to to go below the level of self-states and find that there was 
the shock pathway that could be separated from the, the affect pathway. So, Frank, we can say that uh, slow is fast in uh, TBR. We are slowing the process. We are giving the time and space to the, client, the client's brain, actually, to process. But that uh, leads to a fast, uh, let's say, healing. And also, with TBR, we can go beneath the events. We can yeah. go straight to the pain. Yeah. Am I correct? Yes, that, that would be a good way of, of putting it. And I think the slow is fast is, is good um, because we know what we're looking for. We know that we're slowing it down to look for a particular sequence. The, what has happened in the body at the time of the trauma has happened so fast, you can't pick it up just by being normally mindful, I don't think. I think you have to know the sequence that happens naturally to be able to slow it down, ultra slow motion, to be able to pick up the separate components of the sequence. And that's then what allows change to begin to happen. So very precisely, we focus to the point of disturb in the brain, like surgeons in a way, so precise. And uh, since we find the cause of the pain, we allow the healing of the brain to take part and recover. Yeah, it's, it's like we're turning the, the laser focus of our prefrontal attention, you know, on a specific area that we cannot see, but we know from science what happens in that area and being able to turn that intensely focused attention and slow it down um, seems to pick up um, a sequence that then becomes available for change. And it may be something that's been in the body for decades, and yet when we slow it down enough to identify those different components of it, then it becomes available for change. Mm -hmm. It's very, very interesting. And um, according to my experience, it's very effective. And also it's a therapy that nowadays is very compatible with the Zoom sessions. That's, I think it's a very a great advantage of DBR therapy. And my feeling is that uh, client and therapist are um, connected in a neurological level more than in a verbal uh, level. Yeah, and um, I do encourage therapists to try to be at what I call the collicular self level, to be at the, the, the self that's aware of where we are in the moment and aware of what kind of emotional responses can come in very fast into our awareness. So I do encourage the therapist to try to be at that level as much as possible, to be focused in the present, grounded, but also attuned as much as is possible to the client and what's happening in the client in terms of orienting and tension and affect and shock and horror responses. And I think that um, attempt to attune at that level brings in a different kind of attunement um, into the therapy session. I think it's different from what you would usually get, even if you're very empathic. Empathy can be a very prefrontal to prefrontal connection. And this is something different, I think, that we're aiming for here. And in a way, this attunement uh, creates the safe environment. The client needs to, to process the trauma. And, and I think it also helps the reorienting. It, it creates the safety, it creates the holding for the processing of the trauma. But it also facilitates the reorienting because in a sense, we're both looking at the trauma uh, from this deepest level 
and we're both, you know, focused our attention on that. And that, I think, allows it then to change. Can I just go back to one point you you made earlier your year? Um, you mentioned about being able to do DPR and Zoom, um, and also about how it spread. And I didn't set out to create a, you know, a different way of treating trauma and to train other people in it. It was just that having developed it. I told other people about it and they came back to me saying, oh, this really works. And it spread very fast by word of mouth. Um, and so, you know, that's when I started doing the trainings. And the feedback is generally very good from many different parts of the world that the DPR has been found to be effective by trauma therapists, even when they've got many other modalities at their disposal um, but the, the online DPR is the subject of a study by Professor Ruth Lanius and her team in Canada and that study is well underway um, so I hope we'll get results from that within certainly within the next year. All this era the pandemic era we need uh, Zoom and we need therapy. In the years to come, I think that we need of uh, therapy because people are traumatized at this uh, era a lot. So uh, we need more therapies, more effective therapies to help our clients and ourselves and our society. Do all clients can benefit from media or there are some cases that they will uh, not benefit? Is it safe to use it to all of our clients? DBR does not work for everyone. And I, I you know, I wouldn't say that it would um, work for all the conditions that present. So we have to be careful in selecting and explaining to the patients what's involved. And like every trauma therapy that goes with the intrinsic healing process, there is a degree of unpredictability about it. So patients and clients need to know there is some unpredictability. They may feel worse before they feel better. Um, they, we need to explain to them what's involved in terms of upper brain and lower brain activity and how, you know why we're focusing on the lower brain and the body tensions associated with that. And if they feel able to do that, then one advantage of DBR, even in complex trauma conditions, is that we can go into it very slowly. So we can just take it gradually to start with and make sure that the patient or client is coping um, rather than being overwhelmed. So according uh, to your experience, Frank, how long does the uh, DBR therapy last? Um, we said that slow is fast, but uh, is it a therapy that it will uh, last for ages, for example? The, the study in Canada is of eight online sessions. Um, and I think they'll, they'll show benefits from eight sessions, even in quite a... Uh, a, a severe group, um, but I I think that DPR can still take a long time in people with very severe trauma disorders because we don't want to rush it. We need to take our time, make sure it's safe, make sure that people are coping with it. And, and sometimes um, it's not just individual things that are difficult to countenance, but it's the whole um, trauma history that they, they're gradually orienting towards and they're seeing more and more of what horror they've had all through their life, how badly they've been treated by other human beings, how they've been made to feel worthless. And sometimes it's that awareness rather than specific events that's most um, difficult for people to adapt to and orient towards. 
And so these these um, these instances would require many, many sessions. So it can still take years rather than eight weeks. But I hope that even if people are doing it over years, they're seeing an improvement every session. And that improvement every session is giving them hope that they keep going and they keep going and gradually they get through it and they get better. And that's what's important. And, um, okay, so what is the frequency, according to your experience, what is the best frequency of the uh, sessions? Uh, how often do the sessions need to take place so uh, for the client to benefit the most? Yeah, I mean, since the start of the pandemic, I've been doing online sessions, and for most people, I use weekly sessions. I know that your year has used um, sessions twice weekly for some people with good results, and I, I wouldn't see it as at all um, impossible to be having two or even three sessions in a week with good results from that. Um, but, you know, it depends what people feel they can cope with and what they're able to, to undertake. So to the, the underlying hypothesis of DBR is that for every significant event that's affected us, there's an orienting tension in the muscles of the forehead, the muscles around the eyes or in the back of the neck. And we are looking to access that orienting tension and make sure we deepen the awareness of it so that we've got an anchor there before we go into the shock or the horror or the affects of fear and rage and grief and shame. And we let the processing flow, um, but we've always got that anchor there in the orienting tension to prevent overwhelm or dissociation. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, it's a great honor to have you here and every conversation with you is a truly pleasure and treasure also. Thank mm. you. Thank you, you're, you're, you're very kind. Uh, Frank, thank you a lot for being with us today. It, uh, it is a great pleasure. Your words are really important to us and we are waiting you uh, for your trainings in Greece and to give us your knowledge and regarding DBR. Thank you for hosting this and I look forward to more trainings in Greece and um, the development of DBR in Greece. I look forward to that. Thank you all.